The Test of Time Award recognizes an outstanding paper that has deeply influenced the HPC discipline. It is a mark of historical impact and recognition that the paper has changed HPC trends. We are pleased to announce the selection of the 2002 supercomputing paper, an overview of the BlueGNL supercomputer, as the 2020 Test of Time winner. This work was the first peer-reviewed paper to disclose the BlueGNL system. For nearly a decade, the BlueGene series won multiple Top 500 awards and Gordon Bell Prizes, including finalists, and served as a vehicle for many research publications. These papers included topics of node architecture, application optimization, networks, system administration, fault tolerance, power management, program models, file systems, performance tools, and application science. Additionally, BlueGNL was a precursor of the importance of energy efficiency when it was not a recognized problem in the community and is now the dominant constraint for HPC architectures. This paper has had a tremendous and ongoing impact on the design of following supercomputers. I'm personally very honored and excited to introduce this work as my first job out of undergrad was on the BlueGene team in IBM in 2005. With that, I'll introduce Jose Marrera and Jeff Vetter as two representative authors to present the work, alongside several key guest speakers who will comment on the unique project as well. Good afternoon. I'm Jose Moreira from IBM. And I'm Jeffrey Vetter from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. We are just two of the many authors of the paper entitled An Overview of the Blue Gene L Supercomputer from SCO2. On behalf of all the authors, we're truly honored to receive the Test of Time Award at SC20. Blue Gene L was a revolutionary machine that established new levels of scalability in the supercomputing community. As we will hear today, BlueGNL had a profound impact on science because it enabled computations that simply could not be done before. These groundbreaking computations have had an impact on the sponsor's mission and were recognized with multiple awards, including several Gordon Bell Prizes. We will also hear about the descendants of BlueGNL, which followed the overall approach to parallelism and established even higher limits of what can be done with massive scale computing systems. I suspect many people would like to hear how the Blue Gene project, which involved a large collaboration effort within IBM and between IBM, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and the National Nuclear Security Administration got started. To tell us that story, here is Paul Cotius, who was present at the very genesis of the project. Hello, my name is Paul Cotius. I'm a physicist and IBM fellow, now retired. And I have to say that in my 30 years at IBM research, Blue Gene L took the prize as being the most rewarding project I've ever had the pleasure and honor to work on. So I have to first thank this committee and SC 2020 in general for this tremendous and thoughtful award. Blue Gene L was conceived of during the period 1998 to 1999. And I had been working on IBM's SP, the Scalable Parallel line of supercomputers and and thinking there had to be a better way. I wanted to design low cost technical computers that could be used to tackle deep scientific problems. It had been a decade since I joined IBM, but as you'll discover, many of the folks on BlueGene had science backgrounds and stayed current in their fields. I thought the problem was in the IO channels. The communication, they were just too complex, expensive, difficult to design and customized. I had managed to get a simple IO cell design that could signal between different voltages and allow different CMOS technologies to communicate natively, but I clearly needed help. And it came in the form of Algera, who was thinking similar thoughts, but more about low power at Columbia University, my alma mater. Those of you who know Al understand he is a tour de force, but that's not enough. There are always good ideas around, and at the time, there was more than one idea for how to redo computing at IBM. So after Al joined, we knew what we needed. A contract. The DOE, and in particular, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, had been the recipient of several IBM supercomputers. So it didn't take much poking around to find that Mark Seeger was looking to finance some adventuresome research. Guided by our manager, George Chu, and his manager, Randy Isaac, Al and I went to see Mark on a snowy day in late December of 99. We were looking for funding for a high-speed IO cell. 
But we knew Mark would probably ask why we needed an I.O. cell. And that is where Al explained his vision for 64,000 IBM system-on-chip processors connected in a 3D torus. It was a general purpose follow-on to a computer he'd been working on with Professor Norman Christ in Columbia's physics department to solve problems in quantum chromodynamics. Norman was my first graduate student advisor. We had three problems to overcome. Of course, we desired very low power, which was accomplished by running at very low voltage and frequency, 700 megahertz, when two gigahertz was the norm. And we sought low latency, low power, low cost bandwidth, with which we got with short electrical cables of our design and a 3D auto routed torus operating from a rock solid global clock. And we needed very high availability, which we got by dramatically reducing the hardware failure rate through a very simple node design of direct soldered memory, very reliable connectors, exquisite error correcting codes, and a lot of dynamic sparing. And in short order, we were able to convince Mark that the project had merit. And though we were very disappointed to hear that the adventuresome research monies were already allocated, we were floored and delighted when he asked for a proposal for the full machine. And the rest is history. To turn to a baseball reference, IBM has a very deep, very talented bench and a strong desire to win. And in short time, we had a remarkable team and we're up and running. Thank you very much. Looking back at Paul's retrospective, Jose and I feel that the Blue GNL system was revolutionary in two ways. First, in my experience, the process of designing and deploying Blue Gene was revolutionary. It was a co-design effort before co-design was popular. As Paul described, from the beginning, the project engaged in open communication with academic and laboratory researchers. I remember in the early days of the project, our Livermore team needed to convince ourselves and our management that the Blue Gene architecture would solve important mission science problems. We had to investigate how our applications would perform on this radically innovative architecture using a variety of characterizations and prediction techniques. Thinking back during that time frame, there were so many critical questions about applications, scaling, memory capacity, interconnect performance, I.O., programming models, resiliency, and so on. Fortunately, we benefited from open collaboration with researchers in software and applications in dozens of meetings and workshops. I believe that this openness was critical and it was unique in my experience. I remember helping to organize the first workshop in Lake Tahoe in 2002. It included a long list of IBM, lab, and academic researchers who shared ideas about how to build the system, the software, and the applications. Many of these early cont contributions had a major impact on the system and resulted in significant accomplishments. Second, the technology in BlueGNL was itself revolutionary. At the end of the last millennium, when BlueGNL was proposed, systems with a thousand cores were starting to become more common. The top 500 lists from November 1999 included 16 systems with more than a thousand cores, and one close to 10,000 cores. It took a lot of courage to propose a system with 130,000 cores. Many experts were skeptical that, one, a system like that would stay up long enough to complete any significant computation, and two, the applications and system software on which those applications were based upon would scale. But when people decided they really want to do something and start digging into details of how to do it, we found that, that indeed it was possible to build both hardware and software that would scale reliably to the sizes we're talking about. In fact, there was no shortage of motivated people that were ready to tackle the challenge. The difficulty was inspirational. To learn more about how the Blue GNL system was built, let us hear from one of the lead designers, Ruud Herring. Hello, I'm Ruud Herring. I had the honor of leading the IBM research team involved in the physical realization of the Blue Gene processor chips BlueGene L, P, and Q. The BlueGene supercomputers were deliberately designed to achieve high performance by massive parallelism of simple power efficient compute cores. Power efficiency not only drives energy efficiency, but also 
allows for dense packaging. Power efficiency therefore leads to efficiency in terms of flops per watt, flops per square meter of floor space and flops per dollar. At the chip design level, the focus on power efficiency led us to adopt a system on the chip approach with the best embedded processor core available to us at the time, a PowerPC 440 core, which we augmented with a double floating point unit. We integrated two of these PowerPC 440 cores on an ASIC together with caches, memory controllers and embedded routers for the interconnect networks. The last level on-chip cache could be substantial given that we could make use of IBM's embedded DRAM. The system design was cleanly separated between compute processors, I.O. processors and an external control system. This allowed the compute and I.O. processors to run a single job for a single user, simplifying address translation and permission issues. Having a whole system run off a single system clock simplified the node-to-node -node networking aspects. The result was an ASIC design that, while aggressive for its day, was not pushing the state of the art and which could be developed by a pretty small and new team with the backing of IBM's experienced ASIC's design center and manufacturing teams. The only custom twist to the ASIC design methodology were a few bit stack placements in timing or wiring critical places. The BlueGene L chip ran at 700 megahertz with two cores, each with a double floating point unit doing multiply adds. It had a peak performance of 5.6 gigaflops at 15 watts, 70 watts with the, if you include the DDR DRAMs. The keep it simple approach also extended to the system design. A compute card essentially consisted of the compute ASIC and DRAMs, nothing much more. These compute cards plugged into a motherboard to form a 32-way compute drawer. At the next level of granularity, uh, a crate with 16 motherboards amounted to a 512-way, with each node being connected to its six nearest neighbors. This 512-way had the topology of an 8x8x8 eight by eight by eight cube. At the edges of this cube, the links terminated on an additional ASIC, the BlueGene L link chip. The link chips allowed to either fold the network links back into the cube, forming a 3D torus, or allowed the cube to connect to an next cube, and so on. Two crates on top of each other filled a rack, so formed a 1024 way, which provided AC power and cooling. The control system software configured the link chips per job partition, forming a 3D torus with adjustable size from half a rack up to spanning the whole installation. I vividly remember the first day of bring up back in June, 2003. The chip responded, did everything we asked it to do. And that first evening we had our first program running. A triumph for the whole team after the years of hard work on architecture, logic design, verification, synthesis, time enclosure, design for test and physical design, and software coding. Until that point, I myself had been very much focused on the single chip functionality. In the next couple of days and weeks, I was therefore astonished as ever larger systems started to just work. Every couple of days, it seemed, we achieved another factor of two. Here you can see our first prototype 512 way filling up half a rack, which actually scored number 73 on entering the top 500 in November 2003. Further prototypes and a second pass design started climbing up the top 500 from there. The BlueGene L installation at Laurent Livermore started in late 2004 with 16 racks and grew gradually to 104 racks in 2007, achieving 478 teraflops limpack almost halfway to a petaflop. The Lawrence Livermore machine stayed number one on the top 500 from November 2004 through June 2008, an amazingly long run. There was also broader success. In November 2006, there were 27 BlueGene L computers around the world 
and scientific results started pouring in. Our approach to achieve high performance by massive parallelism of simple, power-efficient processors apparently worked and found a broader reach in applications than many of us would have thought. The BlueGen project worked as both an inspiration as a, as a drive to a broad spectrum of innovations in computer science and engineering. First, there was the relentless pursuit of power efficiency. Large computing installations are power limited. The more power efficient your system is, the more computations you can do per unit time. Then there was the non-trivial problem of managing a system with 100,000 compute cores, plus all the networks and supporting infrastructure. BlueGene had a completely separate and dedicated management network with a database-driven control system. You could use SQL queries to find status and events in your machine. In addition to the main programming environment with MPI, many other alternatives were pursued. I remember in particular the initiative by Professor Sanjay Kale to port the Charm++ programming environment to BlueGene L. And a supercomputer is only as useful as the data that you can get in and out of it. BlueGene motivated the development of large-scale file systems like GPFS and object storage approaches like Luster. There is no doubt in my mind that once we demonstrated that very large systems in that scale could be built, it led to the development of much more scalable services. As another example, BlueGene L led to the development of a new class of performance tools. One of those tools that we developed for BlueGene L was MPIP, a performance profiling tool for MPI. In that era, tools simply could not instrument and capture performance data for 100,000 MPI tasks. So we built MPIP, which forced us to make trade-offs between detail and scale. MPIP is still in use on large-scale systems today. A final legacy of BlueGenL were its descendants. The very successful BlueGenL installations led to the development of the follow-up systems BlueGenP and BlueGenQ. Each of these were packed with their own innovations, leading to another tenfold increase in system size. And yet, one can easily see their lineage from the original BlueGene L. Let us hear more about these systems, back to our colleague, Rude. We immediately started work on the next design, BlueGene P, aspiring to a petaflop machine. Transitioning to the next technology, we could essentially double the on-chip resources and, with a somewhat higher frequency, more than double the compute density. As you can see, the other system packaging concepts stayed largely the same. However, the air cooling of the racks started to become unwieldy. The largest Blugin P installation, the Eugene machine at the Forschungszentrum Jülich, used air to water heat exchangers between the racks, introducing our team to advanced plumbing technology. The machine was installed in 2007 and grew to 72 racks in 2009 reaching one petaflops. The largest installation in the US was the 40 rack Intrepid machine at Argonne National Lab. If BlueGene P was evolutionary, BlueGene Q was revolutionary. Starting the design in 2008, instead of the 32-bit PowerPC for 40 and for 50 processors, we could now avail ourselves of the 64-bit Power A2 core. This core was four-way multi-threaded and we designed a quad floating point unit for it. We skipped the 65 nanometer technology node and went for 45 nanometer technology, near leading edge at the time. On a large chip, 19 by 19 millimeters, we placed 18 cores, 16 user cores, one for operating system services and one manufacturing spare. We designed innovative prefetching engines between the core and the cache. The 32 megabyte EDRAM L2 cache was the first to support transactional memory and speculative execution in a commercially available processor chip. The various networks in BlueGene L and P were collapsed into a single five dimensional torus in BlueGene Q. Running at 1.6 gigahertz, a BlueGene Q node achieved a peak performance of 204.8 gigaflops at 55 watts. The motherboards, still with 32 nodes each, now dissipated over 2 kilowatts and were water-cooled. While high-speed signaling, now at 2 gigabyte per second per link, stayed electrical within a 512-way crate, 
all crate to crate and thus rack to rack signaling became optical. The largest installation, Blue Jeep Q Sequoia at Lawrence Livermore, was installed in 2011 to 2012. At 96 racks of 1,024 chips each, it reached 20.1 petaflops peak and 17.2 petaflops sustained. In June 2012, Blue Jeep Q installations took the top positions in all three lists, the top 500, green 500, and graph 500. For HPC machines, these systems have led a long and productive life. Sequoia and its cousin, the 10 petaflop Mira machine at the Argonne National Labs, were only retired within this last year. We are therefore very appreciative that the Supercomputing Conference has chosen to honor the original 2002 Blue Gene L high level design paper, but really the whole Blue Gene series, with the Test of Time Award. Thank you very much. Blue Gene L was designed to be a scientific supercomputer. As such, it had a system software stack that was designed for scalability and efficiency. We quickly focused on MPI as the main programming environment because we wanted to make porting of existing applications easy. In my opinion, this focus on MPI was one of the main reasons for the quick and successful adoption of Blue Gene by a variety of application areas. The system software also included a lightweight compute node kernel and a more general purpose Linux kernel for the I.O. nodes, which implemented the interface between the computational engines and the outside world. Compilers and libraries that could support the double floating point unit and other features of BlueGNL were also essential. Some packages, like the FFT library, were developed by external collaborators that were eager to help BlueGene succeed. Early on, we had a lot of critical questions about how the system would ultimately perform on real applications. So in the years leading up to system deployment at Livermore, many scientists were refactoring and optimizing software and applications. Ultimately, those efforts were a major success. Now let's hear from Fred Streitz from Livermore. He will describe some of these scientific achievements enabled by BlueGene. So I'm happy to talk about BlueGene L. Uh, what, what a remarkable and innovative architecture uh, that was. Um, so back then, I, I was leading a small team of researchers. I, uh, myself, Jim Glossley, um, Mahul Patel, who at that time was my postdoc, um, and Bor Chan at Lawrence Livermore. And we were very, working very closely with our colleagues at IBM, uh, uh, Jim Sexton and John Gunnels primarily in order to develop what would be this, the day one science application for BlueGNL. And when we say day one application, the, the, really, the importance of that was that when you deliver a machine of that scale, you don't wanna just have to say, well, here's this magnificent machine and here's, you know, here's all the things we might be able to do with it. What you really would like to say is, here's this magnificent machine and let me show you what we can do with it because we have this thing in our hip pocket and we can, and we can demonstrate you know, the utility of a, a machine at this scale. That, that was our responsibility, was to deliver that day one application and it has to be able to make a splash. But that was, you know, that was more than a little controversial at the time because, because fully formed, the Blue Gene L was gonna be well over 100,000 cores. And there were a lot of people who said 100,000 cores, that, that, that's crazy talk. You, you can't possibly use 100,000 cores profitably. Amdahl's law will kill you. And besides that, these aren't even like purple cores. These are, these are 100,000 lightweight cores. And, and you have to like, you know, force everything into that structure. But we persevered um, because we thought honestly that the strategy was a solid one. The strategy was a good one. And, and if, you had a, if you had an understanding of of what the of what your workload in your code was, and you had an understanding of what the architecture was, you could map that and take advantage of the layered memory structure and take advantage of the 3D torus architecture, and you can you can make that work to your favor. So we set down this path, um, and as we were moving along, we had done all the local optimization because we had a development set of nodes at Livermore uh, where we could do all the in node optimization but now we needed to scale out we needed to get to like many more count uh, of, of nodes 
And, and the only rack that was operational was the one in you know, Rochester. And Rochester, you couldn't access remotely, so we couldn't log on to it. So we fell into this pattern. I remember this very distinctly as we head into the, into, uh, the, the Christmas holidays, 2004. Uh, I would be on the phone after dinner because the evening was when the machine was available at IBM. And I would, and I would call Jim Sexton. Um, and I mean call because, I mean, so there was no Zoom or WebEx back then. So literally, I'm on the phone with, with, with Jim. And I would have emailed him some files. And I would say, OK, let's, let's run this, this set of files. And he would compile them and run them and say, oh, I'm sorry, that just crashed. What do you mean it crashed? Oh, OK, I see. I, I, I'm sorry, I missed the semicolon. Can you go edit this file? Can you edit that input and put a semicolon there? OK, we're good. Run. OK, it runs. But no, it runs really slowly. Well, what do you mean it runs really slow? Let's do some profiling. Oh, that's this loop. D damn it. We thought that that loop was fixed. OK, back to the drawing board. Spend the next day working at Livermore with the team and, and, and then back. And we would go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And, and eventually, eventually, we made it work. And we, 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 we surmounted the hurdles. And, uh, and then IBM delivered the machine at Livermore. And LC does a truly magnificent job of standing up this, this machine that they've never seen before in miraculous time. And we make the set of runs and submit the paper to, to supercomputing. And then over the summer, uh, we, start, we, we continue to aggregate uh, our racks until the machine is, is mostly formed. And, uh, and finally, we deliver what was our original intent, which is the, the first science application in history that, that exceeded 100 teraflops of sustained performance uh, during the run. Uh, and for that achievement, we were, we were actually awarded the Gordon Bell Prize in, in, in 2005 in supercomputing. A remarkable achievement and a, and a testament to the enormous effort of the, of, the, of, the, of the team at both Livermore and IBM to make that happen. But I have to say, it, 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 one of the things that I remember the most is at the very end of that, uh, there's a visit to Livermore by, uh, by, the, by the CEA, which is the, uh, the Atomic Energy Commission from France, who we have a very close alliance with. And they're there visiting. And they're, they're, um, we're in the Armadillo Theater. And Bruce, Good, Bruce Goodwin gives a presentation on, on what we're doing with Purple and, and Blue Gene L to support stockpile stewardship and what, where the goals are there. And Michael McCoy gives a presentation about the architectures and, and, and the LC and how we establish the, 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 the infrastructure for the machine. And I, and I end by giving a presentation on, on what we had just accomplished with the machine for, for supercomputing. I talk about this uh, molecular dynamic simulation we had done and I show him the, the now infamous uh, Powers of Ten movie that Liam Krauss had created out of the data from the simulations. And I remember that the, the director general, uh, Claude Guillet, uh, turned to the guy beside him and said, well, this changes everything. Um, and they went out and put an order in for a blue gene system that was then delivered several months later to the CEA. And I often felt that I should have gotten a commission for that machine, uh, but that didn't happen. Uh, uh, but, but, but he was right, though. He was right. It did change everything. Uh, the Blue Genel machine really uh, uh, set the stage for what massive parallelism could accomplish. And back then, you know, it seems quaint now to think about people questioning whether you could use 100,000 processors. You look at modern machines, you look at the Blue Gene Q series, you look at the Sierra and Summit, there are millions and millions of processor units there and no one says, oh, you can't use that because you know what? Yeah, we can use that. It was quite a remarkable time, just an enormous amount of, of fun. And I can, I, I, you know, through all this period of time, I can say that that stands as one of the things that I'm the most proud of, that we were a part of making this, this little bit of history. These achievements would not have been possible without a sponsor in need of new computing capabilities and a sponsor committed to providing funding from the initial design concepts through system deployment. To describe that perspective, we'll now hear from Tuk Hong at the National Nuclear Security Administration. By 2000, ASCII had already successfully procured five large capability computing platforms. These were the ASCII Red, Blue Pacific, Blue Mountain, White, and the just finalized Q contract. All of these machines were getting physically larger and were consuming greater amounts of phys 
of electrical power. The NNSA labs agreed that although this was sustainable in the short term, ASCII needed to explore new ways to deliver computing power, especially as it considered the procurement would finally deliver the flagship 100 teraflop system. For this reason, ASCII started the Advanced Architectures Program in October 2001. And the following month on November 9th, Livermore announced an R&D contract with IBM to work on alternative architectures to, sub to address a subset of NNSA computational problems. Originally, the planned budget for the 100 teraflop system was around 240 million, based on Moore's law extrapolation of the cost of the Lano Q system. In late 2001 and early 2002, after doing vendor surveys to prepare for the purple RFP, Livermore concluded that the 100 teraflop system could potentially be had for less than 240 million. And so it proposed to the ASCII program office if the RFP could be amended to allow the bidders to propose options for other novel computer architecture concepts. Needless to say, Dave Novak, Michael McCoy, and Mark Seeger were together a very convincing sales team. So the NS NNSA ASCII program office approved the requested RFP language change. On April 22nd, 2002, on behalf of ASCII, Livermore issued the request for proposals. On November 19 at SC 2002 in Baltimore, the DOE secretary announced the 290 million award to IBM to deliver purple and blue gene out to NNSA. A major non-technical impact by the blue gene owl project was how IBM and Livermore conducted the procurement practices. With the R&D and NRE phases thus followed by go-no-go -no -go decision points by which the bill system contract will be fully flushed out. This new procurement model was practiced in the follow-on ASC capability system procurements and also recently by DOE Office of Science Oscar program. According to Michael McCoy, the recent Livermore ASC program director, this go no go decision practice was perhaps the most lasting and powerful result of the entire BGL effort because it opened the door to the development and delivery of revolutionary hardware and software in partnership with the vendors, rather than staying with the incremental and ultra conservative path that the vendors had previously preferred because of their concern about not delivering exactly what was promised. With regards to the technical impacts, BGL's three-year reign as the world's fastest supercomputer enabled significant progress in the ASC code development and achievement of numerous milestones for NNSA's Star Power Stewardship Program, some of which Fred Streitz just discussed, and I'm just listing a few others on this slide. In conclusion, I would like to repeat what the then NNSA administrator, Lytton Brooks, said at the October 27, 2005 dedication of the ASC Purple and Blue Gene Owl system. Blue Gene Owl points the way to the future and the computing power we will need to improve our ability to predict the behavior of the stockpile as it continues to age. These extraordinary efforts were made possible by a partnership with American industry that has established American computing preeminence. Thank you. Whenever I speak to people who were part of this project, they often say that it was one of the most fun projects that they've worked on in their careers. I think that this excitement was due to a couple of factors. First, it was risky. During this time in HPC, the attack of the killer micro commodity mindset permeated the community. The blue gene design made researchers think differently about scale and architectural trade-offs. There was considerable skepticism about the design and those challenges brought out the best in many of the researchers working on the project. Second, the openness of the project to collaborate and co-design with industry, academic, and lab researchers was in common. The Blue Gen project also had a significant impact on the development of great technical talent. This was a large research project, as you can tell from the list of over 100 authors in our paper. Working on Blue Gen was a terrific learning experience. 
I know I learned a lot and it made me a better researcher. But let us hear from two of our youngest co-authors, Louise and Karen, about the impact that Blue Jean had on their career development. Hi, my name is Karen Strauss and I'm a Senior Principal Research Manager at Microsoft Research. Hi, and I'm Luis Sezi. I'm Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Washington and CEO of OctoML. We were super happy to hear about the Test of Time Award. Uh, the Blue Jean project was a really, really amazing uh, project uh, where we had the privilege to, to work with uh, really incredible researchers at the IBM TJ Watson Research Center and really has opened doors to us in, in our careers and showed to us very early on in our graduate careers uh, how, what it is like to work on big and ambitious projects. It was really, we really had a, a blast and we're really grateful to have had that opportunity. Yeah, and I, I couldn't feel uh, luckier to have uh, that project be in the very beginning of my, of my career. Um, and I feel like this, this project had uh, shown me and us, showed us that how, how an interdisciplinary project can be so fun and so rewarding. You know, we had everything. You had, you know, hardware design, interconnection networks, uh, thermal issues, uh, system software, uh, math libraries, and so on. And that style of research really, uh, I guess, you know, formed the research personalities of our careers. To this day, we've been doing highly interdisciplinary work and, uh, you know, we couldn't feel luckier. And we're very, very, very happy uh, that this paper got the Test of Time Awards, but most importantly, we are uh, very happy to have had the chance to participate in the project and get to know the team and many of whom are uh, very good friends and uh, mentors of ours to this day. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, we would like to thank SC20 and the Test of Time Award Committee for this award. It would not have been possible without the commitment of hundreds of people. We hope that you've enjoyed revisiting the history of Blue Jean L and the people behind it with us today. Thank you so much for being with us today.